Well, you've probably gathered I'm not Eddie Lyle, and if you come here to hear Eddie Lyle especially this morning, you're going to have to wait a month or so. So I apologize for that. In the early service, just before uh, I was on to speak, we sang the hymn, Great is the Darkness, then I preached. <laughs> but it probably wasn't as bad as on one occasion I was uh, down to preach, and on the order of service it said, Lance Burt's preacher, then the hymn afterwards, there must be more than this. <laughs> right. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you for the opportunity of sharing with you again. And Chris, obviously, is over at Little Fishes uh, today. We're coming to Romans 8. And I didn't know what Mark was going to do in bringing this um, session of sharing about the persecuted church. But... What I have this morning fits in with that in a, in a real way. Romans 8 is an incredible passage of Scripture, and it's very important as well. Um, we haven't got time to plumb its depths at all this morning. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in Westminster Chapel in 1961 and 62 took 36 weeks to do the thing that we have less than 30 minutes on. So we'll see how we get, but when we are in uh, Dublin this uh, summer for a weekend, we wanted to see as much as possible of the city, so we clambered onto one of those tour buses, and it's one of those hop-on, hop-off ones. So we're hopping on to see as much as we can quickly of Romans chapter 8 and the verses I'm going to read in a moment, but every now and again we'll hop off and just go in a little bit more detail but where I hop off may not be where you want to hop off, so there's plenty for you to do later on. This passage that we're coming to has so much to say to us about the hope of our salvation, the hope for Syria, the hope for the world around us, but the hope for us as well as we live in Durham, in Norfolk, wherever we happen to be, to live as hopeful people. Let's read from Romans chapter 8. I'm going to pick up from... Verse 15, it's in the middle of a paragraph, if you're reading from the New International Version. I know Pastor Chris is reading much more nowadays from the New Living Translation, but I'm an old fuddy-duddy. I still wear a tie. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for that chorus of a... <laughs> it's all right, isn't it, David, to wear a tie? Yeah. Okay. Verse 15 of Romans chapter 8, it's reading to the end of the chapter. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the, uh, our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. 
And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's just have a quick look of where we get to in Romans 8, in the passage up to then in the book of Romans. In a sense, there are three aspects of salvation that we see in the first eight chapters of Romans. There's a story of a little girl on a train. She's an ardent salvationist. And she's sitting opposite an older man. She didn't know he was a bishop. But in her zeal, she said to the man, Are you saved, sir? But in a higher-pitched voice than I just used. And he replied with a smile on his face, Yes, dear. I have been saved. I am being saved. And I will be saved. That's biblical theology for you. And from the Bishop of the Church of England, so that's good going, isn't it? The first few verses of the book of Romans are just an introduction where Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation. But from verse 18 onwards of chapter 1 to the end of chapter 5, it's really, I have been saved, and it's an exposition uh, how God has made a way for us who have sinned to be forgiven, to be set free, to have a right relationship with God, not through our works, but through what Jesus has accomplished in his death on the cross and in his resurrection. I have been saved. But secondly, I am being saved. Because we know that there's still weakness in our body. There are still temptations we face. The struggles going on. And the law is weak in itself to save us. Paul ends up at the end of chapter 7 of Romans saying, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. There's an ongoing work of salvation now in our lives, making us more like Jesus, preparing us for all that is yet to be. Because the third aspect of salvation is, I will be saved. I will finally enter into all that God has won for me in Jesus Christ. And he, in chapter 8, describes how the Holy Spirit particularly brings us the assurance that we are God's children and brings us that certainty of hope that we have for the future, that we will, in Christ, have resurrection bodies in a new heaven and a new earth. And he sums up that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I just ask the question, though, really, why is this important? Well, we've just seen with the situation in Syria and the Christians there who are faithful to Christ that they need hope. They have hope. They're not there just 
in a sort of a rear guard mission. They believe in a God who is in charge. They believe in the power of the gospel to transform people in the darkness of that situation. And Paul writes towards the end of Romans, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you, as you overflow, sorry, that as you trust him, you may overflow with hope, with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. We've been going through Luke's gospel recently in, in this congregation. And we've been seeing how they, in Jesus' day, were in a hopeless situation in many ways. The Jews under the oversight of the Romans. And yet Jesus is coming and speaking words of hope into their situation, ministering to people's lives, delivering them from bondage of spiritual forces and physical illness. He's bringing hope that he is the Messiah, God's promised one for the people of Israel. But in our 21st situation, whether it's in Syria or where it's in Dirham here, there is much that is hopeless. So we've seen something of the situation in Syria, in the DVD. We seem to lurch from one economic and political crisis to another. I gather Chris was talking last week about the politics of fear in the in-out uh, referendum discussion. We're not about fear. We've been delivered from fear. We have a message that is full of hope in a political and financial world of turmoil but in personal situations as well. There's tragedy, there's illness, there's loss. You know it, I know it. I read somewhere just recently that the biggest core killer of men under 45 today is what? Suicide. <clears throat> Christian hope isn't wishful thinking. I hope we'll have a wonderful summer this year. Well, we might, but it's still wishful thinking. But it's a certainty based on the purposes and the promises of God declared in the scripture and demonstrated in Jesus. You know Christopher Columbus set out, well you don't know it personally, but in 1492 he set out from the west coast of Europe to the New World. When he set out he didn't know where he was going. When he got there he didn't know where he was. When he came home he didn't know where he'd been. Well, I don't want you to be like that this morning. So, four things to tell you where we're going with this hope of our salvation. First of all, peace with God. Secondly, the purposes of God. These are peas in a pod, it's alliterative. And uh, they are prayers to God and promises from God. First one was peace with God. I'll be quick on this, so even though it's vitally important. When we get to Romans 5, Paul sums up the fact that Jesus has won for us a right standing before God. He says, therefore, since we have been justified, just if I'd never sinned, made right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. It's past tense. It has been accomplished. As we put our trust in Jesus, we have sins forgiven, we have a right relationship with God, we have peace with God. How many people are there in our world today, maybe in this room this morning, who want peace in their lives? A peace with God, a freedom with God, that hope that we're not dogged by our consciences and guilt through our lives. And the amazing thing that God speaks to us about this peace with him is that we have a father-child relationship with the father. There's only one human being I've ever called daddy, father, because I was his child. Likewise, I can truly call God father because he has declared that through faith in Jesus, I am, we are, his child. And the Holy Spirit bears testimony to this. Verse 15 that we just started with. By him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. 
The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. There's a story of a little boy in the times of the Roman Empire, and uh, he was watching the victory procession of an emperor coming back after a victorious campaign. The emperor was leading, and then there were all the slaves and the captives that he's taken, all the booty that he had taken in his campaign behind him. And this little boy was coming down from the ranks of the watches, trying to make his way through to the front of the procession. And a soldier stopped him and said, You can't go there. He's your emperor. Whereupon the boy turned to the soldier and said, He may be your emperor, but he's my father. And we have access, not just to an emperor, but to the king of kings, the one who reigns in majesty of which we've been singing. Yet, of course, the promise comes that we are co-heirs with Christ, but while we're here on this earth, there will be sufferings. We've seen that on the DVD as far as Syria is concerned, but for each of us, perhaps. But there are, secondly, the purposes of God, Peace with God, which gives us a hope. But the purposes of God declared in this passage and other places in Scripture about what God is doing, even though from a human perspective, it may look pretty dry, uh, drear and hopeless. So secondly, the purposes of God. Because this passage, verse 18, starts with a very confident statement. He said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Did you get that word? In us, not just around us or about us, but in us in the time to come. No matter what we're going through now, for you, for me, for the world around us, what is coming is worth waiting for. You could say it's the sort of groan before glory. Paul uses this word, as you've heard in the passage, three times, groans, that deep yearning and longing and pain deep within our spirit. You could think of these sort of things. Persecution for Syrians and many, many, many others. Pain and illness, groans. Betrayal, when Christian betrays another, which is one of the most hurtful things in Christian fellowship. Doubts and fears, death, loss, and that struggle with temptation in our life. Jesus, remember, said, No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And it goes on in verse 19 to say that the whole creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. J.B. Phillips in his translation way back of this passage says that creation is on tiptoe, waiting to see what's going to happen, waiting to see what God's going to do, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed because at that time the whole of creation is going to be renewed. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And he gives this picture of the parable of pregnancy. Now, I have to say, and I have to confess to you with all honesty, I've never been pregnant. So I can only speak second-hand about this, but I have been four times at my wife's side when she's been in those last stages of the pains of pregnancy before the joy of new birth. And Paul gives this picture of a painful time of waiting, but it's going to give to excitement and joy and fulfillment. And he says, so it is with the whole of the creation, a bit oval, I'm afraid, but the whole of creation. It's as though it too is in pains of pregnancy, waiting for something to happen, waiting to be liberated, waiting for that new heaven and that new earth. But it's not just the creation, the created order that is dysfunctional, that isn't working as it ought, where there is strife and trouble, earthquake and famine and all the rest of it. Not as God intended it, as a good creation. 
But we who are Christians, that's you, me, we also groan, even as God's children. I know when you groan. It's when the sermon's announced. <laughs> oh, not him again. But no, we who are God's children also are the ones who groan, even though we have the first fruits of what God has promised to us. Creation groans, awaiting its liberation from decay. We groan as we wait for the fullness of salvation. I have been saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. We've been justified, we've been made holy, sanctified, but we are yet to be glorified. We eagerly await the final resurrection to a new heaven and earth. We hope for what we do not yet have. Yet the Spirit gives us a foretaste of fullness, Paul says, in verse 23. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The first fruits were given at, say, the uh, festival, festival of Pentecost, the first fruits of the wheat harvest as a thanksgiving to God. But they were awaiting and anticipating the final harvest at the time of tabernacles when all the harvests were brought in. It was the festival of Pentecost where the first fruits were. That's symbolic, isn't it? That we, from Pentecost, from the giving of the Spirit, have that down payment, that first fruit of what God has promised. I'm a simple sort of soul, so little simple illustrations help me, really. You may wonder what a Christmas cake's got to do with it. Well, my mum used to make Christmas cake in October half term. Uh, we used to get all the uh, fruit out of the cupboard that had been stored over the year in rations time. Those blue sugar paper packets, do you remember them? No, you don't. Okay. And we would eagerly anticipate this rich fruit cake being covered with marzipan and then royal icing and decoration, which we could have on Christmas Day. Mmm, I love it. But we had to wait for it. You could smell it in October. It was in a tin for the next eight weeks. But then, Christmas Day, you had it. Oh, the waiting, the anticipation. But... Mother used to take a small piece of the same rich fruitcake mix and make it into a small cake that we could have now. And so we have the small rich fruitcake down payment, first fruit of the life of the Spirit within us, as a promise of all that is to come in all its glory, more than any Christmas cake, but in the glory of what God is doing in redeeming this world. So we have hope for the future. I, I have some questions here. I don't know about you. I, I can understand sufferings in part, and it can be visualized on a DVD like we've just seen. But I'm not sure I can fully understand or visualize the coming glory of Christ's return. Can you? You see, I do believe that God is the creator of all things. That's a miracle. To be created all things out of nothing. I do believe that Jesus, the Son of God, is both fully human and fully man. That's miraculous and supernatural. I believe it. I believe in his atoning death on the cross. That again, miraculous, because it was followed by the victory of the resurrection over death. How can that be worked out in human understanding? I believe it's in his bodily ascension that he's at the right hand of the Father now, interceding for us. And I believe he will come again and Jesus' lordship will be recognized and seen over the whole of creation and will be exercised. We will receive our resurrection bodies in the resurrection of Jesus and there will be a renewed heaven and earth. I cannot visualize it. I don't know what it means in the fullness and detail of reality. But this is Scripture's promise to us, for us personally, as part of God's plan for the world. 
Thirdly and quickly, we've seen something of peace with God as a basis for our hope in life. We've seen something of the purposes of God, that the thing isn't just grinding on hopelessly, but God is going to bring things to perfection ultimately. But thirdly, there is prayer. Hang on, something's gone wrong here. Never mind. Uh, There's prayer to God. The Spirit helps us in our groaning. Verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us for groans, with groans that words cannot express. So the promise is that the Holy Spirit both spurs us on and urges us to pray, but when we don't know how to put those prayers into words, he then interprets our groanings, our unspoken uncoordinated yearnings of the heart into prayers that are acceptable to God. I'm glad he does that. That's no excuse for us not to pray intelligently, but when we can't and we don't know what to pray, God's Holy Spirit is helping us and giving us hope that even when we can't work it all out, when we can't say to God what we want to say, God's Spirit is helping us in that. We have four married children, and we have 12 grandchildren. Three of them live in Northern Ireland. And because they live in Northern Ireland, they have a Northern Irish brogue, which is lovely to hear, but hard to understand. And the youngest one, Charlie, who's three, he has the policy, if Grampy doesn't understand him the first time, he shouts louder, which isn't all that helpful. So I turned to his two older brothers, Seb or JJ, and said, what's he saying? And they interpret for me what Charlie is saying so I can understand it. Now, I'm not likening that J.J. and Seb are like the Holy Spirit, but you get the idea that there is a translation of what seems unintelligible into something which is meaningful. And the Holy Spirit gives us hope in that aspect as well. But fourthly, and I think lastly, the Holy Spirit brings to us promises from God to establish our hope. Peace, purposes, prayer, and now promises. Hope, first of all, because God is a good God. Verse 28. A much used verse, but a hard one to put into reality. We know, says Paul, not hope or think about or consider, we know, says Paul, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. I can't always see at first sight how that works out. Tragedies, pain, loss, experiences at a time that seem to overwhelm us. But God says, not my heart, not my head, God says all things work together for good for those who love him. Let's remember the character of God. Is he an evil God? No. Is he a good God? Is he a righteous God? Is he working for our ultimate good and the ultimate good of the whole creation? He is. I was at the Portuguese service last night, and every now and again you get this word, Amen. Amen. So it seems familiar, George, that you would say, Amen. At least there's one person who agrees. Again, just a simple illustration, if you will. How do all things work together for the good of those who love God? It's a mystery, but there's an ultimate reality. You know, these ingredients for a cake, flour, I don't like eating flour, raw eggs, don't like eating raw eggs, a bit of fat, maybe, uh, sugar, okay, I'll, I'll get on with sugar, a bit of water, maybe, and all the rest of it, a bit of salt, oh, blood pressure goes straight up. But put them all together, put them in the oven. Ah, all things work together for good. Now, it's a trivial, stupid illustration, but you get the idea that the individual components of our life and experience sometimes do not make sense. But God, the ultimate master baker, as it were, forgive me, is making all things for good to them that love the Lord. 
even in our most dark and confusing times, Paul says, God gives us hope through his love. Romans 5.5. 5. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. If we go on in verses 29 to 30, there are five great statements about what God has done. He has taken the initiative to give us hope in our salvation. These are sermons in themselves, and I don't think you want to stay, even if I would be happy to do it. We are foreknown by God. That boggles the mind to start with. We have been predestined by God to be conformed to the image of Jesus. He's making us like Jesus. That's what he's called us for, and we've responded to that. We've been justified. We've been justified, made right with God. And we will be glorified. So, the promises of God, because God is a good God. But he's a God who is for us. There's this litany of things here about who's going to condemn us. Can anything condemn us? God the Father doesn't condemn us because he's made us his children. Jesus doesn't condemn us. He's died for us on the cross. And so God is for us. Sometimes when the heavens seem black in our spiritual experience, when voices of cynicism surround us from friends and family and the media Never doubt this, that God says, I am for you. No one is going to condemn you because of what I have done means I am for you. And there's hope because Jesus is interceding in heaven on our behalf. Again, a simple picture, but, you know, simple that I am. I have this picture of me standing before Holy Father God in heaven. And Holy Father God is looking at me and saying, Lance Burks, I know all that you've done. All that you've said and thought. And I can see that there's a problem. Then Jesus steps in and says, Father, it's okay. He's ours. He's believed that my death on the cross has made possible his forgiveness. And God the Father says, welcome, child, on the basis of what my son has done, interceding in heaven for you. And hope because of God's unbreakable love for us. There's a car owners, hmm? Third party and fire insurance only. I think comprehensive covers better, isn't it? Well, there's comprehensive cover here from verse 35 onwards. Who's going to separate us from the death of the love of God? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, death, life, angels, demons, the present, the future, the powers, height, depth, everything else in all. Nothing! Is going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We used to do a bit more climbing than we do now, but on the borders of Switzerland and Italy, we climbed up to this col on one case, and there there was an empty cross. There was also a shepherd who'd come up nearly every day from the Italian side. He was about 18, as wizened as an old stick, but had more energy than a lot of us put together. In all these things, says Paul, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I don't know whether you can see that. Now, I've just put something else on the picture there. What do you see? The Nike swoosh. You see it on sportswear, on trainers, and probably somebody's wearing it today. The reason I put that up, the word in Greek, which means more than conquerors, is hypernikiel. Nike, Nike, however you pronounce it, was the goddess of victory in the Roman world, in the Greek world, sorry. And uh, so Nike means victory. Whenever you see the swoosh on sportswear, you just say to yourself, more than swoosh. In Christ we are more than conquerors. So just an idea 
for you, fuel your thought. So the question comes then, really, how do we live? In whom is our hope? Is it blind optimism in man's ability to sort things out? Very grateful for all that technology and science can achieve. But ultimately, is that going to sort the situation? Or is it in despairing pessimism where we say, I better get off the train here because it's just going to run into the buffers. I'm just going to wait till Jesus comes. No. We are to live as hopeful people. We have the foretaste. We have the experience of the Holy Spirit within us now to say that there is more to come. Whenever we say Father in our praying, the Holy Spirit's witnessing to us that we're a child of God. He's witnessing to it that we're heirs of God, that we are co-heirs with Christ, that we're set for a wonderful, amazing new heaven and new earth. But we are to demonstrate that now in the way that we live as hopeful people with our neighbors and friends, in conversation when people say, oh, doom and gloom, maybe to inject the power of Jesus into that conversation. We don't buy into this negativism that there is going to be an outcome to our world situation, which is God's glory. And therefore, what we do is important. Towards the end of 1 Corinthians in chapter 15, 58, Paul writes, therefore, after he's talked about the resurrection from the dead, he says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. That's the prayer for the civil service. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Somebody has said, It's not pie in the sky when you die. It's steak on your plate while you wait. We know where we're going. That gives us a peace in our heart. We have a hope. And we can guide other people in that hope as well. It's almost as though we have a spiritual sat-nav that sets us free. Because most times we know where we're going with a sat-nav. We live as those who are hyper-victors. And God's promise is that he's going to make all things new. That's pretty hopeless, isn't it? Well, my attempts at expounding it may be hopeless, but this is a hope of salvation in a war-torn, despairing world and in your life and mine. Amen.